Honorable Minister of Education and Culture, Vinod Taudeji, Sudhim Dakulkarni Ji, the author of the book, and Chairman Observer Research Foundation, Mumbai, President of Anjuman Islam, Dr. Zahid Khazi, Vice Chancellor of the Mumbai University, Dr. Sanjay Deshmukh, Shri Shobit Arya, Managing Director of Wisdom Tree. Distinguished guests, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I confess, I have read, but infrequently, some of the writings of Sudhindra Kulkarniji. Some years back, he was gracious enough to send me a copy of his very interesting collection of writings on what Mahatma Gandhi would have done with the internet. It is tempting to typecast. Could he be called an archaeologist or dubbed a futurologist? Neither would do justice to his work. To me, it is evident that Kulkarniji has the mind of an explorer, a visionary in quest of new worlds. The book before us is one such venture to build a new edifice on the ruins of the past. And yet, because this is not a greenfield venture, it is essential to understand the nature of ruins on which the rebuilding is to commence. The task of the historian, said Ibn Khaldun, is to lift the veil from the conditions of the past. The present case is also a matter of living memory and therefore not immune from sub subjectivity of greater intensity. The post-truth, in this case, arrived seven decades earlier. The challenge for us, therefore, is threefold. One, to understand what happened in 1947. Two, to examine the role and limitations of the principal actors. And three, to explore realistically the options for the future. The happenings of 1947 has rightly been described as a tragedy to which the two-nation theory contributed. The British role and their anxiety to leave India on terms most advantageous to them is well known. But was this sufficient to bring about the division of the country? Some of the iconic personalities cited in the book and others not mentioned played a role in articulating and shaping perceptions for over two decades. Their final statements, if such a term can be used for what they said on August 14, 15, 1947, have therefore to be seen in a wider context of their role in the development that led to the final decisions. The critical question is simply put, why was the partition plan put forth by the British accepted? Much has been written about the experience of the functioning of the interim government of 1946-47. In the discussions preceding and during the crucial All India Congress Committee meeting of June 14, 15, 1947, opinion was divided, but both Jawaharlal Nehru and Vallabhai Patel supported partition. Their line of reasoning as per public record was not identical. Nehru felt a compromise with the Muslim League would result in a weak India, that is, a federal India 
with far too much power in the federating units, adding that partition would be temporary and that Pakistan was bound to come back to us. Patel felt, as he put it, that in spite of my previous strong opposition to partition, I agreed to it because I am convinced that in order to keep India united, it must be divided. He added in a speech in Bombay on 30th of October 1948 that we accepted partition willingly and after a full weighment of its consequences. Ten years after the event, Maulana Azad attributed the decision of his principal colleagues to anger or despair that clouded their vision, adding that the verdict of history would be that India was not divided by the Muslim League but by the Congress. It is therefore difficult to disagree with Shri Sudhindra Kulkarni's conclusion that, and I quote him here, history's verdict casts the responsibility for India's partition on both the parties, although the Muslim League's guilt is decidedly greater because it anchored its demand on the two-nation theory. And yet, the thought did persist with some of the decision makers that the impending happening was somewhat unreal, not altogether desirable, and hopefully transitory. The latter aspect, however, was not investigated or spelt out. Even more glaring was the apparent abs absence on all sides of reflection and articulation of the economic implications of the division of what had hitherto been one economic unit for over a century with its own imperatives and socio-economic consequences. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, the theme of the book before us is to project a scenario of the possibility of a South Asian Union with India, Pakistan and Bangladesh confederation at the core. Its underlying assumption is the possibility and desirability of an India-Pakistan rapprochement. Our focus is on three nation states of recent origin, of different sizes and capabilities, diff differing versions of the past, conflicting ideologies and national security perceptions, but sharing geography, ecology, and wider human security challenges. Our author seeks a solution by plunging headlong into the core of differences. He suggests a cultural and spiritual confederation that would subdue and overcome extremist perceptions of those whom he is not disinclined to name, reverts to what was said by some political and spiritual personalities, and cites with approval Maharishi Aurobindo's words that the desired change will come by an increasing recognition of the necessity not only of peace and concord, but of common action by the practice of common action and the creation of means for that purpose. Idealism, however lofty, has to be tempered with realism. Common action is easier done on areas of convergence then of divergence. This conversion is to be sought by moving beyond the traditional paradigm of conventional security into those of human security and human wrong. Both are ignored by the governments and societies in our region. There is a crying need for the recognition and implementation 
of both. Only then would we develop the perception and capacity for correctives. A beginning, therefore, has to be made in regional cooperation with a focus on human security problems, on movement of people, and on trade without unreasonable restrictions. The common traits in cultural traditions and historical narratives need to be transmitted to a younger generation through conscious promotion rather than studied prevention of cultural exchanges, films, and other cultural activities. The experience of SARC has not been encouraging, and therefore, alternate strategies have to be explored. The proposed new structure would have to be voluntary and devoid of overt or covert coercion. There may be lessons to be learned from other regional organizations. The practical approach to my mind would be to make haste slowly, to be accommodative rather than exclusionary, so that negative perceptions are allowed to fade away. Political commitments and modalities have to surface to resolve outstanding areas of disagreement. Foremost amongst these is what the Simla Agreement of 1972 called a final settlement of Jammu and Kashmir. Its domestic dimensions as well as the trans-LOC incursions have been in the news of late. The state is doing all that is necessary to confront and repel terrorism. The state also has a duty to ensure that the rights and dignity of our citizens in the state of Jammu and Kashmir are respected and ensured, and shortcomings effectively addressed. Alienation of any segment of the citizen body within our land does not contribute to the overall health of the republic. Chale chalo ke wo manzil abhi nahi aai. Jai Hind.